Yes, sir. Um, the particular request in this case is actually um, a request that is on the same property that the Commission saw earlier this year, but it is a much different request. Uh, the history with it is fairly unique. Uh, during the last residential rezoning, staff had been meeting with the developer who was moving back to this area who was interested in developing um, this type of community, this assisted living type of community. We met with them on really multiple other properties in the county. With that, they finally settled in on this one after hearing that it was successfully rezoned amid some contention earlier this year. You have within your packet the developer's particular request and site plan to this particular site, which is a portion of the subject property. Um, it's currently subdivided into two pieces. They're seeking to rezone just the 24 acre piece. You have the current version of your site plan or the site plan within your packets. Staff has worked with them. Um, this is really the second version of the site plan. We do believe it's ready for your consideration. We tried to list uh, in our packet all the things that we did consider uh, within our analysis, but ultimately what it evaluated and what it um, came to test as is a recommendation of approval by staff with zero conditions. Um, the conditions that we felt were appropriate were placed on the site plan. But ultimately, I don't have uh, really any other updates to report. This one has remained fairly static throughout the week. I don't have any uh, opposition to report, no phone calls or inquiries to report to the commission tonight. So I know you had questions. I've tried to relay some of that information on based on the work session to the applicants and their agents so they might handle or address those. I do believe they're here and I do anticipate them to speak tonight. Otherwise, um, the overall recommendation of staff was for approval. Really, the approval is tied to that site plan, and we'll try to answer any questions you might have, but should you so choose, we do believe it's ready to move forward with tonight. Thank you, Jason. Commissioners, any questions for staff on this presentation? I've got one. Mm -hmm. I want to refer back to when we were discussing before about the traffic issue at mm -hmm. Tillman Crossing. Yes, sir. And, and I think I spoke to Bill later, he said that they were looking at some other options there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the outcome of that is, or are we going to try and put some, trying to alleviate that congested area, maybe keep from killing somebody there? Yes, sir. We do want things to be safe there. And, you know, for the record, what has happened is the commissioners have approved and gone out to bid for a project that is going to contain a three-lane section. Um, let me see if I can find the map that will show. I think the zoning map is a good one. The three-lane section is going to go all the way from Tillman Crossing, which is where this hits old US 41, south all the way to Grove Point, the entrance to Grove Point, really is, is those are the two ends and beginning. Um, I've seen the plans with my own eyes. Um, they are out for bid right now, and uh, out for bid with that bid is expected to come back to the commission for approval of that three-lane. Um, and so that three-lane section is out for bid right now. Um, I will be honest, I think the stoplights at either end of that section are still under consideration, but at least the widening with the turn lanes, uh, I believe, is, is headed for consideration and approval by the county commission. Yes, sir. Mr. Tolson, a couple questions. First, I, I want to say again to the commission, um, I'm the president of the Homeowner Association of Stone Creek, so for what that's worth, Jason, I understand, or I think I understand, that a, a, a PD zoning would be tied to this site plan, is that correct? Yes, sir. Then is there more detail to the widths and, and, and where placement is on the ground of these improvements that we're not getting in here? Um, I think that this is the concept they've given us for the layout. Um, staff has some administrative approval for changes in the layout, but we've tried to um, consistently hold firm on the maximum square footage and the densities. But should something come up in engineering that we just don't know about, we do have the flexibility to change the layout. We do know that they probably will change the exact location of the driveway. If you look on the site plan, there's a condition that relates to the house that's located directly across the street. We anticipate when things are engineered and lined up, 
they're going to bury the location of that driveway so that it's not shining directly in the back of that residence. So that's an example where we think we have administrative approval over some other change like that. But if they came back and said, you know, we'd really like to add another building for 120 units, that trigger would, it would trigger another public hearing back to the Planning Commission and County Commission for consideration. Um, second issue is there, I have to say there, uh, this is much better from my personal standpoint than the first. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, you know, one of the conditions on the prior zoning was that all of uh, improvements on the prior buildings with base interior street. Mm -hmm. um, at least two of these buildings look to be no more than 30, 40 feet off the road, which are directly behind existing residences. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if there is room, maybe the developer can address this, if there is room for a vegetative buffer of 30, 40 feet between this entire development Let me start with the buffer and the setback, and I do think the applicants can probably speak to that issue as well as the, the railroad blocking issue. Um, the buffer, if you look at note number six, um, there's an existing very healthy buffer on some of the crossing out. And the language was added, the existing vegetation along the crossing road shall be preserved as much as practical based on site grade. So that's the language when we ask, what do you plan on doing with that vegetation? That's what they came back to us with. You know, could the language be stronger? Sure. Do we feel like it was redoing for a new site plan? We did. We felt like the intent was there for us to say the buffer is going to be kept, but they wanted some flexibility when they're doing their grading for driveways, etc. So I think that's what's there. I do think they will be willing to speak about setbacks, but I'll let them address that. Um, there's nothing special to us about the buildings must be located 50 feet from the property line. That's just strictly their, their choice. Um, the minimum we have is a 30-foot setback, sir. So I mean, that's our minimums there. I believe they're exceeding that, but I can't tell you why they were to come forward rather than push back. Um, so that's buffer setbacks, the railroad crossing. Yes, it was a concern. Um, we did that. We did look at that. I would think um, with the traffic, that was the dominant, if not... Um, one of the dominant concerns for that because the concern is a what-if scenario where you have an emergency vehicle that has pulled up and is now waiting on a train before they can cross Tillman Crossing. Um, at the end of the day, I can tell you that the county engineer looked at this in detail, um, and I can say that the initial um, blocking of Tillman Crossing would perhaps be tempered by an alternate route through the entrance that is immediately south to Stone Creek, which is not as far south as the main entrance. But under current road conditions, that is a concern. And under current uh, railroad usage conditions, the most unofficial information I can get my hands on, because I couldn't find anything official, was that they have about potentially 25 um, trains on that track right now. Um, and that was, you know, within the last week, unofficial. Let me, let me just try to get my hands on something. But with that, it doesn't alleviate the concerns. It kind of puts it into perspective about maybe how frequent that is. I 
think probably the most definite thing I can give you is that I know for a fact that the county engineer has looked into that issue and that his vote was still for approval and not for a special condition and not for denial. And I think he was definitely aware of, um, of that concern. So I think it's a concern not only for this property, but just in that general area as a whole with current road conditions. And I think that's all I can offer you is that we were, we were aware of it, homework was done on it, we did not believe that it warranted a denial or a condition for this particular development. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I for the frail elderly that provide rooms, meals, personal care, and supervision of self-administered medication. An alternate way I've heard that through the applicants, which I think they're going to get to in greater detail in their presentation, is um, this is a level of care that does not yet require skilled nursing. So this is a more basic level of care before you get into what you think about with a nursing home, a skilled nursing level of care. So I think they'll, they'll go into details, but we have a ULDC, def, ULDC definition, and I wanted to add to you something that I feel like is helpful in my mind about basic level of care, not yet skilled nursing care. Is the word frail defined in the ULDC? <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe frail, um, I don't believe frail is defined. Uh, no, sir. Because I, I'll tell you the, the, the concern that has been raised Sorry, if this would somehow allow for outside of mm -hmm. your common assisted living, if that did not become a bound by common use, it sure. would also be used for some type of transitional or mental type housing because of the, the lack of state facilities doing that these days. Yes, sir. Um, so I don't know if that's a real concern. I've heard it voiced, but I don't know. I think it's some sort of knee jerk. We can address it that way. Sure. I'm going to have to lean on the applicants when they speak to kind of address that in their operations. As far as what we could do um, as staff, is essentially you would say, here's our site plan. It was approved for assisted living. And now we're coming back and we want to do um, a congregate personal care, which is how I think that would be classified, which is. So there is a separate. Yes, which is a, a kind of a large scale, um, a larger scale personal care home, which is different than assisted living. You could, staff could argue that that change in definition <coughs> would trigger a public hearing because it will be different than what was presented. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't, I don't think the site plan says anything about tying it to assisted living in particular. So you could potentially address that with a condition if you're that concerned about it transitioning from assisted living to a concrete or personal care home. Um, otherwise, you would be leaning on staff's and administrative interpretation to say that was not consistent with the site plan and would have to come back. My concern with that is in our language here, we do try based on experience to give the applicant some 
flexibility. So that way we don't have to come back for very small issues. We've learned the hard way. We just would rather not do that. The flexibility we give them is OI zoning, which is office institutional zoning. Um, we felt like that was an appropriate set of uses that if they are not there, that would be a transition to something else. I, I think a congregate personal care home would be allowed for OI. So that gives you some gray. If that's a real concern, you could tighten it up by an additional condition. Um, or just, just assisted living is the only way I can think of really tightening that up. We talked about different things about multifamily, et cetera. Multifamily is not allowed, so that would be a you know, that would be a clearer use to say as a re area. But congregate personal care home is is a grayer area. It's not as clear because OI allows that, but it's just different than the intent of the system living. So we're we're being very specific. It's a good question. I'm just trying to brainstorm out loud and a quick response about how maybe that can be handled. <coughs> Congregate personal care? No, for this, for this development. Right now they're showing uh, 55, 53, total. <clears throat> is, is that maximum? I believe that's, I believe that's minimum. That's minimum that they would Yes. Yes. I think those are based on our own minimums in our code for how this used to be classified. Ms. Carmel, is that accurate? That's correct. I think they exceed the number of handicapped commissioners. I don't think we require as many handicapped and they exceeded that, but I think otherwise there is a minimum number. And that's that's up for debate. You can go lower than that because it's PD, or more than that because it's PD. Is there right now any restriction as far as how much of the land can be developed? Because right now they have developed, the development, the proposed development is within that dash, that dash line. Yes. And there is another dash line that goes through the middle. site plan is oriented as such because the applicants are wanting to develop just this. They don't, they're not seeking for an eight acre assisted living and a you know, 16 acre R10 subdivision. So the site plan is for 24 acres of this development. That's why it's oriented like that. Now when it's broken down further, they have to deal with a restriction in our non-residential PD standards that actually required couldn't have more than 50% of the site as open space. Honestly, I believe if it were up to the applicants, their initial request kept the entire perimeter as open space. But there was a problem that with our within our code. And so rather than pursuing a variance, the solution that we arrived upon with the applicants' help and thank you for that was to make some of the open space a civic or public use space, which is the trails. I think it adds a very nice feature makes it more useful than just flat out open space. So part of the way they depicted that is because our own code said basically you have too much open space, which is a very interesting problem to have. That's the first time I've ever dealt with someone who had too much open space, but that's why they, they have done that. And that's how we kind of evolved to this, is rather than ask for variance for that too much open space, they decided to use it. I believe, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, their intention is to restrict the use of that open space to the residents and visitors of the community. So I don't believe they are proposing, and nor are we asking them to, a new public park for the area. This is as an amenity to the development, not as um, a new public park. And so that kind of gives you an idea about the open space and the public use spaces. I, I'm going to check. I don't know if we have a definition of open space, and we do not. So I can't tell you, you know, here we have this, and this is how we define it, but open space, green space, typically for us is undeveloped space. And the applicants, I, I really think, have done that here because they wanted to show me very clear they did not want to put, a, you know, the assisted living units and then surrounded by R10 houses. They wanted to be specific on 
we're okay with showing our intent for 24 acres is for assisted living, not for some kind of things. question for someone a little bit more knowledgeable in building, but we got 35 feet because that's a common residential height. I'd say two-story, sir, but I I don't know if a builder could enlighten us about whether you can fit a three-story on 35 feet. I think it would be a Does that include the pitch of the roof, or is that, uh, that, 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 that includes the pitch of the roof also? Yes. Oh, that would include the, include the entire building. Yeah, so I mean that's that's the entire that's the entire including the roof. So don't think it just goes to the height of the eave, it's the entire structure. Uh, second question I see right in front is this stamp commercial use. What is, is the OI considered commercial use? Oh you see what I'm talking about? Or is there yes. going to be a commercial use within that? The um, I believe the engineer was just trying to show us how they denoted different spaces. So for example, if you look around the, the um, amenity building in the middle of the community center, it has a civic public use and then kind of some dashed lines. I believe the commercial use is just showing you that that's what he defined in this space as commercial use. So when they're dividing out the PD as open space or civic space or commercial space, that was something he showed as, I classify that space as commercial. Okay. Right. And that's for our calculations. Maybe I don't believe without that. that. I think I think they can definitely explain right. that, sir. No further questions. Mr. Dean, other questions for staff? If there are no more questions for staff, we will open up the podium to anyone in favor wishing to speak in favor of this request at this time. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of this request? Good evening. Can you please state your name and your address, please, ma'am? My name is Martha McGill, and I live at 4872 Gentleman Plaza in St. Howard, Georgia, which is um, the property of the So you, you reside there? I do, I do. Um, the back of the property, actually, if you look up the entire 72 acres, you can see the home there. It's actually right in the middle of the 72 acres. So we live there, and um, we're surrounded by this beautiful pecan orchard, and our idea is to build the facility up near the front of that. I could tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a nurse. I grew up in South Georgia. Um, I went to the nursing school at Boston State, and had the pleasure of serving on the board of nursing for um, the state of Georgia. For a good number of years, I ran the Children's Hospital at Emory University as well as the Children's Hospital at Grady, um, downtown Atlanta. For the past five years, I've been the Chief Operating Officer at the Children's Hospital in Miami. So I've been around healthcare a lot. I've um, ran major trauma centers at each of those locations. I've built new hospitals at each of those locations, including trauma centers. I ran the EMS for the pediatric portion of EMS for um, each of those locations. So I'm quite familiar with when it comes to, um, you know, if we need to get an EMS truck in there, you know, what's involved and what's not involved, what delay matters and what delay doesn't matter. And I certainly looked at this to, to address um, Mr. Paulson's question very carefully because, you know, you always want to make sure the safety of your residents is your first priority. Um, but a couple things I'll mention is um, when the EMS truck is activated, there's many railroad crossings that could potentially get through in a town like that also because we have, you know, it's a busy rail area. Um, but generally speaking, with an assisted living facility, when you're activating EMS, it's more of an urgent, not emergent situation. And so the idea would be that you would have a plan in place if the crossing was um, blocked, which could happen certainly if this crossing or any other crossing could be blocked. So, um, the licensing criteria for um, assisted living is really specific in the state of Georgia. And you have to build in a real specific way and you have to operate it and staff it in, in a real specific way. 
Um, one of the things that was asked about, you know, what are the patient's right? A patient has to be able to um, seek egress in the event of an emergency evacuation, such as if there were a fire in the building. So um, your patients aren't bedridden. Um, some of them may be in a wheelchair or need a walker or a cane for assistance. And, you know, they are frail. And that's why they end up in a facility. But um, the idea is that they're more independent than dependent. I'm happy if there were a lot of questions that were asked. If, if there's one that I could um, address from an operational perspective in addition to the EMS, I'm happy to do that. I was just curious if you just said that, that you allow the wheelchairs and walkers in, in conjunction with everybody else there too. I'm just, just curious. I know that another one of the facilities here locally, once you get to that wheelchair or walker, you have to move to the other side or whatever. So. Is that, um, which facility is that? Langdale. Langdale. So Langdale has an independent living, and that's the most of their beds are independent living. That's correct. So when you um, need more assistance and you move to what, they're not licensed, I don't believe, according to my discussion with the state licensing board, um, they're not licensed the same as what we're asking for. I think they are licensed as personal care, but it's a similar type um, level of service, quite frankly. So what I believe you may be referring to is when the patient needs to move um, from independent living to um, assisted living. And so ours will all be assisted living. We have no um, intention of in the independent living. We could change, you know, um, if there were um, such demand, but we nurse and my intention is to, you know, come back home and really serve um, those consumers that need it. And one thing, one other thing I'll add is, um, you know, I've been on this journey of taking care of children throughout Georgia and Florida for 30 years and have loved it. It's my complete, total passion. My father, um, who was an engineer, um, in Tipton, Georgia, um, passed away December 30th. And the last thing he asked me to do was to come home and care for mother. And I had, at the time, had been talking to a friend of mine who does this. She does assisted living facilities up in Atlanta. And I spent some time with her and I said, I know this is my next calling is to come here and do this for this community that I love so much. So our intention is to try to um, give back to our community with the skills that we have. Do you plan on keeping your residents on the, on the property? I do, and my daughter will go to Bowdoin School, right across the street. So, um, and we have family members who live um, in Stone Creek. In fact, the first um, house inside Stone Creek is, is my husband's sister. <laughs> Commissioners, questions for presenter? Yes, I have one. Uh, there was some question about the parking. Uh, at what, 53, we said? Uh, do you anticipate a lot of a lot of vehicles from the people that are, who, uh, that are living there and uh, and staff parking is such as that? Is that going to be a problem? Actually, I think we're building more spaces than we'll need, but this is what's required. You know, like I said, but the, the requirements for licensing are very specific and it includes parking. And so, um, obviously, we have to have parking spaces for our staff. We expect to have around 60 staff members. But that's 24 7, so mm -hmm. you have to divide that by 4.2, and that's kind of how many of you there at any point in time. Um, most of you residents don't have cars. By that point, you know, their family members have kind of decided they don't need to be driving, they're not comfortable with them on the street. And we would, at that point, we would be taking responsibility for them, so we'll shuttle them around town, get them where they need to be going, that sort of thing. There is on the site plan that Jason shows you, um, there is a community building. And there's a commercial kitchen, I call it a commercial, because um, the idea is that we would hire one chef who would oversee the nutrition. But my husband's 10 years older than me, and he always tells me, well, what's, there's nothing more important when you get older than food. And so I believe that as I age, I you know, always look forward to my next meal. But the intention is that it would be a differentiator for our service, that we would have really um, kind of farm, I grew up on a farm farm-to-table um, top meals um, with, uh, that are good. Um, we have Ollie there, my staff will be there. Um, I've eaten hospital food for 30 years, but so my intention is it's a little better than that. And then we'll distribute the food out to each of the homes because you know, this concept is a little bit special. And you know, the state licensing board really likes it because it's a community. It's not one big institutional building. But our idea, you know, as I sat with my father, his last 30 days, because he was dying, you know, you walk in your last days, and you know, everybody's not keeping you like he was, but as, as you're aging and dying, you know, most people don't want to leave their room, they don't want to leave their home, because you feel like you're giving up something, but then you 
beer for an interview too. Our intention is to create a community type environment where you can live in a house. You know, it's a 16 bedroom house each of these. And it, they're, they're one story. And they look and feel like a house that you know, maybe you live in. But also the idea is that they're pretty and that they're nice. My husband's a general contractor. He's built homes throughout um, North Georgia and Atlanta um, area. And he builds beautiful homes. So our idea is that this would be a way to incorporate his skills as a builder and yeah, and on as an artist on the administrator into one project. Thank you, ma'am. So the height on the building is only on that one story? Yeah, with our patients, if you have more than one story, you can get an elevator and lots of other issues. But again, it gets away then from our concept, our philosophy, and our concept is it's a home type environment. So you one story building into Correct. They're, they're all ranch style homes. They're just very large ranch style homes. Okay. Actually, just curiosity. If, if you have a demand for more independent, would you would you take those in rather than assisted living? With I suppose we could. We hadn't really talked that through. But well, you could. separate those. I'm just, you could, just curious. Because you, you have different homes. So each, you, know, you could purpose one home just for more, uh, more independent than one home for more. And you probably would do that anyway because we want to hire the most trained personnel to work with the, the patients that need more support and the patients that need more independence. You want to have your, you know, your more focus on activities, you know, and less on care. So, um, it just practically thinking about it, you're probably putting your more independent patients together and your more um, patients that need more support together. Excuse me. I know the, the more institution you mentioned earlier, I know they have quite a waiting list for their independent side, so that possibly be a big mover. True, true. But then again, that also comes back to, I know that all those folks on the independent side all have their own vehicles too, so you may come into a little parking thing there too. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Commissioners, anything else? Are we going to have mental health patients and Alzheimer's and have a lot of families? We will have memory care patients. Um, you know, that's a, and and there, there's a gray area when you cross from not feeling like you're a memory care patient to so, you know, we'll have to do real specific evaluations. <coughs> and I might be in the stage now, some of the questions that you have to have a lot of them. Yes. Walking out. Yes, yes, I believe there will be. And my intention is one of the houses, if, if, there, if the demand grows two of the houses, but generally speaking, it wouldn't be more than that with all the criteria that I've read. But the intention would be that um, if there's a patient who has Alzheimer's or just dementia, um, that we would be able to accommodate them. And many patients, you know, kind of, you, you know, as you're aging, um, a lot of people have more memory care issues than, than not. And so you have to be able to take care of that full continuum of patients. And another thing I'll add about that is, I worked at Newark for 25 years and some of the chairman of the neurosciences and the Center for Aging quite well. And my intention would be that I'd be able to work very closely with them. Um, there, because there's a lot that's going on in, in, in terms of the health and well-being of memory care patients that could go down the dementia and um, improve their, their study of, of mental health, quite frankly, that a lot of patients don't get, particularly in South Georgia, because they're just isolated from the resources, such as they have a memory. So my intention would be that I would be able to bring um, that level of care to these patients that, that need it. I mean, I'm dealing with it. My mother is 77. Any other questions, Commissioners? I have a few, but I'm not sure if they're for you. And you feel free to direct me to your professionals. But, um, I have asked Jason about some possible restrictions. I wonder what your thoughts are as far as a vegetative buffer between Tillman Crossing and your development. So that there's a what do you side mean, buffer. Trees or? Well, I'm leaving some of the pecan trees. <coughs> Placing it behind there so there's not such a I mean, I'm willing to look at anything, but I'll tell you the further, I don't go back to the, the site where it shows the actual trees. There's an area where the trees have died, and there, that seems to be a low point on the property. And so I'm going to take advantage of that and take out as few trees as possible. I'm going to directly bring in the trees. My idea was there's a 
Is, or, or is, it, is the facility required to be fenced? Is Lanka placement? I believe that the road it is. At, uh, at the, the, I don't, at it's, it's required to build, it's it not we want because you, you, know, you don't want it to look like. It's not a proxy fence, it's just a rail. Yeah, yeah. What I'm talking about is decorative. Yeah. 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 If I could interject, my concern is the compatibility.
one more question based on something Brad said. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact you were leaving pecan trees and they're gorgeous and everything. Do you, do you plan on continuing to work in the pecan trees or are they just going to be a tree? Well, we are, and we're learning a lot about pecan trees. I grew up on a farm that wasn't a pecan farm, and so we leased the trees this year for a gentleman um, after I talked to people at the county extension office and figured out um, I had a lot to learn before I took care of them. <laughs> so, just, so just going forward, uh, there would have to be some kind of guidelines as far as if your folks want to watch them, them walk the nature trails if they're out there blowing chemicals eight or ten times a year. Okay. I'm just, just curious. I just want to make sure you're going to maintain that. For sure. Our idea is to keep as many of the trees as possible. I love that idea. And like I said, I'm going to live there. Those trees are what I look at every day. Not um, the back of the building or the front of the building. You know. You learn how to make money for countries. I've got 56 acres, I can tell you also. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Commissioner? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak briefly in favor of this request? Give me a state your name and address for record, please. Uh, my name is Stephen Kellum. Uh, I'm the architect on this project in my office. It's located at 1806 Plum Street. And uh, just very briefly, uh, Celine had asked a question about the architectural style. Uh, we are going to be keeping a uh, residential style of architecture. Uh, I have some very preliminary sketches that I'll share with you, but this is not anything definite. Uh, but we are looking at a craftsman style house, so we'll be using architectural shingles. Uh, we'll be using board and batten siding. Uh, we'll be using uh, stone. Uh, we'll be using some lap siding. Uh, the columns that you associate with uh, the craftsman style, the window styles, and, and those kind of things like that. So, uh, like I say, these are very, very preliminary. The owner saw these for the first time tonight themselves. But we're trying to we're trying to stay away very intentionally from an institutional look. We want that residential look with what we're after. Be wood frame construction, as a matter of fact. You know, we're not going to be doing any, you know, mid rise, contemporary looking style of building or institutional looking building or anything like that. Very nice. I was curious to see the fact the materials here. Um, is yeah. Same materials that are in stone creek and other things, which is what we'll be, what we're going to be doing. Commissioners, any questions? For the We'll open it up for one more in favor. My name is Bill Ken with Innovate Engineering. I'm the civil engineer on the project. Um, I think I remember most of the questions. Um, as far as the location of the entrance, um, it was twofold. There's there's a wood line where the pecans end, that, yeah, got that oh, sorry. picture of so the pecans end, there's a diagonal line there, and then that's on the west end, and then on the east end is their property corner. If you roughly cut that in half, it puts the entrance where that clearing is, which is generally a low point. We do need to control storm water, et cetera. So that was generally the idea of what, why it's where it is horizontally. Um, plus, we're taking advantage of the natural lay of the land going toward a 36 inch pipe underneath Tillman Crossing Road. Um, we do have the flexibility or try to build in there that if we need to shift it to not point, have the driveway point directly at the residential home across the street, we will. As far as the setbacks off the Tillman Crossing, what you see on that side plan is I've tried to keep it 60 feet. And, and those two buildings right there, that's the side of the building. They're not facing, they're actually facing interior. Uh, that'd be the, the side, they don't have any side elevations where you look at it. You'll see windows. So, 60 feet from the crossing. 60, 60 feet from right away to the side of that building. And then you'll see on the, is this the side plan? You've got like a little gravel road here. This is for fire protection. 
the, the entry road, the circle, and the parking will all be asphalt in the little service drive here. Um, this will be some sort of material, a, a millings, a, a crush and run, gravel, something. That's for uh, fire access, fire protection. Um, we'll, we'll ring the, the development with, with water and have hydrants in there. And uh, sanitary sewer, there's eight inch force main along Tillman Crossing. We're exploring whether we can get into the lift station over Carlton Ridge or if we need to build a new lift station there. Um, the question of the, the, the uh, traffic signal. Um, according to Mr. Fletcher, when I spoke to him a couple weeks ago, this intersection already qualifies. It's called warranted. It's already warranted for a signal. Now, whether that's part of the bid package, I do not know, but apparently not. But I get the impression that a signal will be put in soon. And I've also talked to Mr. Fletcher about the, the train situation. It appears most of the blockage is due to the Scruggs Company just north. And they, uh, they have deliveries that come like six times a month, roughly. And generally, they're, they're there in the, making their deliveries from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. And, and, and we already have Carlton Ridge, who uh, their entrance is off the Tillman Crossing, so if there were an emergency situation and that crossing were blocked, the uh, fire and ambulance police, they all know to check the next entry into Stone Creek to cut through. If it's blocked as well, they get to the main entrance. So this would be no different. The development, we will, we will meet the ULDC codes as much as we can for uh, development purposes. Parking was um, based on the minimum requirements in the ULDC, which based on their experience and their, their need, um, what they have, what we have shown exceeds what they'll need, but it meets the minimum as defined in the ULDC. Any other questions? Any questions? Just a quick question. Is there any concern with the proximity of the driveways? Is there any issue about it? Uh, no. Yeah. No. The, this development, when we project and how much traffic we think will be generated by this development based on generation notes, this, this development will generate approximately half the, the amount of traffic that the R10 development will really create in a, on a daily basis. Would there be any issue in lining up the entrances other than Um, from, a, from an engineering standpoint, no, there's no issue with that. That's more of a, uh, their desire for it to be roughly where it is. Is there any plan for the, the secondary entrance further west to be gated or? We haven't spoken about that. The, the, this there's being the driveway, front, driveway, right? there's an existing driveway right here. There's a, there's a dirt path that goes along the pecan orchard. And um, this will be our secondary entrance for the fire protection. Um, possibly they can get that to only allow the owners and the emergency vehicles to access that gate. I don't think they want any agent to drive up in there. Commissioner, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Yeah, thank you. I think we've explored all of those in favor of. Is anybody here in opposition to the request? Anyone here in opposition to this request? There being none, any discussion amongst the commissioners? Only one thing I want to point out. I want y'all to understand. One of the reasons I have made the point about emergency vehicles, in addition to the emergency nature of the presence of this place in the railroad, is that plan that we just spoke about all the emergency vehicles know if they're going to call from me, if they're going to this new development. If they can't get across the railroad track, they take the next way to the next way to the next way to the next way to the next That in itself, and anybody else that wants to go to those two developments, Stone Creek owns the road, Stone Creek pays to maintain it. So anytime we have an additional traffic burden, whether it be emergency vehicles, or vehicles going to call from me, or people who are here that don't want to we're going to come off more drive, and we're going to go all the way down to 41 and then up to the crossing railroad track. 
they're going to come through and use our road. And we're going to pay for that road. So that's one of the concerns I have with that department about that's going to work this one. But I want y'all to understand that. If there be none, we will accept the motion on this. Could, could we hear the conditions and then, just, and, then, and then discuss them before we put it in a motion that would make it easier to talk sure. about them if you would? So, number one being the gate for Western Most Entrance and limited to traffic on here the owners and emergency vehicles. Number two, there would be no allowance on the property for a congregate personal care home. Number three, so there would be a 40 foot vegetated buffer between Tillman Crossing Road and any development on the property, whether that be entrance roads, fire protection roads, or any other type of development plan to serve. For all lighting to be downward and inward facing on the property. For the main entrance to the road would be in line with Tillman Bluff Road, entrance to Stone Creek, and for there to be decorative fencing along Tillman Crossing the length of this road. Mm -hmm. Concern with the, the alignment of the driver that was one of the 
hindi ko So, I'm, I'm just creating two entrances. Uh, yeah, I understand, and I was just wondering. Uh, I see one lot across from that, and that's what you're trying to protect with the car lights and noise from that one lot across Tillman Road. I don't, I don't know if those are active. They've got a lot through about seven or eight lots in the railroad entrance. But it's not The traffic count is going to be at 
development side. I think that's what, is that what you referred to as the line we have to eliminate the double lining? Or? No, I'm, I'm referring to the cars coming out of there oh, okay. at time and shining in people's house. Okay. As far as lining up. Now, as far as other lining, I think it all should be any development, whether it be this one or any other, should be downward and inward facing so that you can provide a lot of solution. Any additional discussion? Do you want to repeat the conditions again? Just come on, would you read them? You want me to read them? Brad, Brad, you read them. You wrote them. To gate the westernmost entrance, or, or excuse me, yeah. I should probably say to gate the any entrance, secondary entrance. Than the secondary entrance. Mm -hmm. No allowance for a congregate personal care home. 40 foot vegetated buffer, all lighting to be downward and inward facing. Main entrance to be a nine, the Tillman Bluff Road entrance to Stone Creek Development, and decorative fencing along Tillman Crossing Road. Well, thank you. Uh, Any additional discussion? Any they're, they're trying to save as much of the vegetation, the, the trees over there as possible, and they're taking advantage of a, a ball spot already. So, you know, if it's anyone here. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's the only thing then that I would have any, uh, any heartburn with. Anybody else, Tom? Along those lines, you know, this is sort of nitpicking, but call civic and public use. Uh, nature trails that can't be used by anybody other than the residents just to meet the land development guidelines is a little bit suspect. And that's a very liberal reading of our, yeah. of our regulations. I, I, I agree, but then. So, so using additional space for that, but then you might not burden anybody except but, the public. But then threatening to close the roads through there, so of course you can't go through there too, it's a little nitpicking. I'd like to pay for our roads and our upkeep our roads. I don't want to do that So the so Stone Creek maintains their roads and their mm -hmm. Yeah, I realize that. Who maintains Killman Crossing Road? County. 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 Is there a walk in the source line? Or I can just move the yeah the entrance. I, I, I and I understand the point. If I was in that house and and, and, and that was going to be a burden, but I that's something I didn't look at when I went out there and looked at it. I didn't go out there at night and stand there and look at it. it looks like there's a lot of trees there, but I'd have some some, some questions with that. And but the others, I think, are very good suggestions. Something needs to be considered, but I don't know if I want to make that a condition or not. I'm just kind of wishing more shit on that right now. Well, <clears throat> I want clarification. I'm sorry. There is kind of a note number four in here on the drawing that says final entrance location shall be determined by the engineer of final development plan approval with respect, with respect to the existing residence on the south side of Human Crossing. The entrance shall be moved so as not to face directly toward the residents. So this has been clearly discussed by the applicants, by their engineers. And they mentioned that they could consider realigning the driveway in a way so it's not a direct um, access, a mm -hmm. straight access. And I don't know at this point if consideration needs to I don't know how to go forward or how to, yeah. I, don't, I, 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 have, I take exception to um, us saying that the driver needs to be moved. Um, whereas I know, for example, within the city of Augusta, the driver would have had to align with the uh, street across the street or not. Well, either align or be at least so many feet so away. So many feet away. Which this is it does mean that it's, it's enough, it's sufficient uh, clearance. So, Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd like 
you said it's only been addressed there on vote four. They're willing to shift it one way or another and keep it coming right into the back of someone's home, I think, instead of shifting the whole thing 200 or 300 feet, whatever it is. It's, it's a little much. If you're going to, everybody needs consideration. Oh, yes. Everybody needs consideration. <laughs> and I, I think these folks also need consideration. If you said 10 cars coming out of there at 11 o'clock at night, you know, versus shifting this whole thing to prevent the lights from 10 cars at night. Uh, I know you're not, I'm not one of the people that's living there. At the same time, folks have, they have vegetation that breaks this up. Uh, they have Venetian blinds that break this up. Uh, I don't know if we're not, if we're not getting kind of carried away with something that may not have to be carried away. I would be more concerned with cars being blocked in an emergency and they can't get out. We've been beating our chops on 10 cars or four cars. You know, we've been all upset. What happens if somebody's having a cardiac arrest? You say, that's fine. The lights aren't shining. Let's, let's think this thing through and, and, and try to figure a better way. In other words, let's let the real thing be the real thing. We're talking a bunch of money out of somebody's pocket. And we're also talking, trying to be reasonable as to how, you know, how this thing can work. Or either we need to just say that's all the whole. I don't know. I don't have an answer, but I do know that we're starting to getting off in the deep end of saying what if, what if, what if. Let's let the main thing be the main thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Even if they move the driveway, cars coming out, and they turn left, and the lights are going to go across somebody's I point out, I'm sorry to belabor this, and it's fine to bring it to it, but my point is that those people that are receiving those lights, they live by an entrance, and they, they get those lights. Right? We're talking about putting traffic that comes out of this neighborhood into different people who don't live by an entrance. And, and respectfully, I'm not beating a dead horse, and I'm not going down the road. Those people are there now and have been there. This is a conceptual cycle. It can be changed. It can be moved three hundred feet without any additional cost except some piping to a, a low place if that's what they want to pipe. This is there this put stop is put there, it's real said because there's an existing pipe there. So all it takes is piping at three hundred feet. That's all we're really talking about. When this driveway comes out. Even if you move it to across from Tillman Bluff, the people that live on either side of Tillman Bluff have no lights coming into their house right now because there's no traffic coming from that side. Actually, I mean, they're, they're, they're coming from both ways of Tillman Bluff coming in, so they're getting that light. I was thinking yeah. more of the, the lights coming But I mean, that's, that's fine. I think one has been made. Ooh, that's a problem with conditions. If there is no more discussion on this, Mr. McClendon, go ahead. Mr. McClendon. No, I was trying to figure which one of you are we going to say. Right. Okay, next. No. But the point when we did the original R10 development on this, the entrance was working. That was one of the things that came out of there. So this isn't any different. 
here at the county commission. Conditions? Do we have a second? Uh, second. We have a motion by Commissioner Paulson, a second by Commissioner Hall. All in favor of the motion, please take time by raising your hand. Carmela is 7 0 unanimous. Yeah, 12 hours here. Thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, Jason, 